wife Lynn and I had the opportunity to recently travel for the first time in a long, long time. So we had two weeks off. We went to Charlottesville, Virginia for a wedding. It was for Lynn's sister's daughter and hung around there for a few days, went and visited her brother up in Virginia Beach, Norfolk area. And uh, it was interesting because my older brother got saved in Virginia Beach uh, when uh, he was newly married and got saved. And I mentioned the name of the church to my brother-in-law. He goes, oh, yeah, that's right down the street. I go, really? Rock Church is right down the street? He goes, yeah. I said, I'd love to see it. And so I went and took a picture of me pointing to a church, you know, which no one would know what it means except for me. But it says, Rock Church, and it says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Came back for two days. We flew to California. You know, it's crazy to fly right now. I don't know if you've, the first time I've flown in a long, long time, you have to wear a mask. You have to wear a mask in the, you know, the airport. You have to wear one on the plane. And, you know, I don't know where you're at with the mask thing, okay? I don't see a lot of masks. I know some people wear masks. There's, there's the mask. There's the non-mask group. There's the don't ask, don't tell mask group. And this whole thing is just kind of crazy, isn't it? I mean, everyone's just uptight. I walked into Panera Bread yesterday. It was raining. We pulled up. We ran in. I had my mask. But because it was raining, and, you know, if you wear glasses, I wear them to see for distance. You know, everything fogs up the minute you do anything around here. And so I got foggy glasses, my, and I walk in, and this lady behind the counter, I mean, I'm, I'm literally about from here to where you guys are sitting, and I walk in, and she goes, Sir! Put on your mask. <laughs> okay, okay. And it's, uh, you, uh, suddenly you feel like you're a leper or something, you know, like, <laughs> I'll put it on, you know. But it's, it's, it's just weird. And it's creating a lot of anxiety. It's creating a lot of anger. And it's creating a lot of tension with people. This whole COVID thing, not just masks, right? I mean, people are depressed. They're They're isolated. You listen to news at all, it's talking about an upswing in suicides. Uh, believe it or not, because couples are home together a lot, there's a lot more tension in the marriage. Any of you experience that at all? No, you guys just, you're always lovey-dovey. Hey. But, but, you know, Lynn and I have been doing these um, marriage uh, podcast things because there's a lot of tension not that we ever have any tension in our marriage, but there's a lot of tension in marriage. And we, we have been married 42 years. We've got uh, three children that are grown and 11 grandchildren. And we both came from totally different backgrounds. I grew up a good part of my early life. My mom was a single mom with five kids. And we lived in every rental house you can think of in Pensacola. We lived on Blunt Street, Mallory Street. We lived on Booby Street. We lived all over Pensacola till my mom remarried and she moved to Gulf Breeze. Well, Lynn's parents never divorced. Her dad was a, like an executive. He marketed milk all over the Northeast. He, he owned a dairy farm at one time, very stable, very well-off kind of family, and, and we came together. We met at Bible College. And so I went to visit her for the first time, her family in West Springfield, Massachusetts. There, there's a point to this story, and we're going to do the Bible. We're going to get into it in a minute. So, so I go to visit, and um, I meet her dad, really, for the very first time. I mean, I had met him very briefly once, but here he came. He came home. He would fly out every day to do his advertising, and Mark comes in with two briefcases, suit on, and here I am, a Bible college guy with kind of curly hair, never really had a real job, you know, and I'm just in awe of this guy. And so I convinced her parents to let Lynn come back and spend a week or so here to meet my family and hang out. And so Mr. Norton, Lynn's father, drives us to the airport. We're getting ready to leave. I'm in my 20s, so is Lynn. And, and so we're driving down the road, and I'm in the back seat, and Lynn and her father in the front seat. And I'm a little intimidated by this guy, I must be honest. So all of a sudden, before we get to the airport, he pulls off to the side of the road. 
I'm thinking, this is where I'm getting out. <laughs> you know, one of these, I'm thinking. And, and he reaches back, and he takes my hand. And then he reaches over, and he takes Lynn's hand. And he goes, I want to pray for you too. And I was just astounded. I'd never had a father figure pray for me. I didn't know dads did that kind of thing. And so when we're doing this podcast, we've, this is our third one's coming up this week, I'm telling that story. And I said, Lynn, do you remember when we first met and your dad, and he, took, he stopped, he pulled over and grabbed my hand and he grabbed your hand, and all of a sudden Lynn tears up. Because her dad passed away quite a while ago, and she's just start crying while this, the filming's going on with this podcast. She's like, oh, yeah. And I stop it, and I look over at my son who's filming, and I go, should we stop here? He goes, oh, no, this is good. This is really, this is, this is good stuff right here. So, so I say all that. To, because there's difficulties, we certainly don't have the most perfect or all together, but we're just sharing some basic principles that we've learned over 42 years of marriage, raising three kids, and now stepping into the world of grandkids, which is a whole other dimension of life with our kids and with each other, if you know what I'm talking about. It's just a whole different season. So we're sharing some of that. encourage you to, to tune in. also encourage you to share it with someone that you think needs some principles about marriage. Okay, enough of that. Let's go to Romans chapter 16. We're finally at the very last chapter of Romans. And I want to ask this question. How many of you are old enough to remember when we started Romans? Is there anyone out here? <laughs> it's been like a million years ago. And, and this, this last chapter is interesting, and many Bible commentators will not even write much about this chapter because it seems kind of redundant, and it seems sort of, well, that it doesn't like apply to our lives. But, but I think it has a lot to say. When, when we were in uh, Virginia recently, we were actually in Charlottesville for a wedding, and I was uh, thumbing through some magazines and looking at sites that are nearby, and about an hour away was this thing called the Natural Bridge. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It was naturally shaped like this, and it's very well known in the area of Charlottesville, Virginia, about an hour away, and thousands and thousands of people have been to this bridge, and they write their name on it, name, thousands of names everywhere. And one of the names that's inscribed upon this bridge is the name of our first president, George Washington. George Washington wrote his name on there. And I say all that just to say this, that people, all of us, want to be remembered. They want people to know our name. We, we want to leave something behind, uh, some kind of memory, some kind of legacy. And here in chapter 16 is a long list of names that Paul kind of rattles off. People, men and women, who never dreamed in their life, I'm sure, that one day thousands and millions of people for generations would read their names in the Bible. Now, now listen, please tune in. In chapter 16, we don't see so much the Apostle Paul as the great theologian as he's demonstrated up to this point, as he's talked about God and who he is and our relationship with him. We don't see him here as the evangelist, which he was, powerful evangelist. We don't see him as the sacrificial missionary, and he was that to the T, but here in chapter 16, we see Paul, a man who cared about and who loved people. This is chapter 16. It's another picture, another painting, another image, if you will, of the Apostle Paul and who he was. He talks about greeting. It appears 19 times, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, 17 of them come from Paul himself. And, and then there's, there's 33 names that are mentioned, 24 to those who's writing to in Rome, 
and nine who are with him in Corinth, as he writes. So when you think about Paul, the apostle, if you read Acts and, you know, watch him as a missionary, if you read his letters, I always had the kind of feel of Paul as kind of a driven, hardcore, you know, this guy that was no nonsense, unstoppable, you know, get the job done, huge intellect, planting churches, evangelizing, moving on, not, not, not taking time with people who have failed him. Leave that guy behind. We're, we're going for it. But Paul cared about, kept up with, and he remembered people. He remembered them by name. And Paul had involved himself with people from so many different regions. Chapter 16 has basically three parts. We're going to look at the first part, verses 1 through 16, that has to do with his friends, his brothers, and his sisters in Christ. He then tells a warning about phony believers in Rome, and then a final greeting. The letter, known as the Book of Romans, was carried to Rome from Corinth by a businesswoman, probably a scroll Maybe underneath her cloak, I don't know, a woman by the name of Phoebe. And the Apostle Paul calls her sister, he calls her servant, he calls her saint, and he calls her helper. Look at verse 1 of chapter 16. And I'm going to work really hard to keep your attention because this is just a bunch of names. Look at verse 1. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister who is a servant of the church in Centuria. Centuria was the port town of Corinth where they would sail out. She helped establish, I think, the first church there in Corinth in that city. He says, so I commend her to you who is a servant of the church in Centuria that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of saints, a sister in whatever business she has need of you, for indeed she has been a helper of many, and of myself also. So Paul says she's a sister, she's a servant, she's a saint, she's a helper. And he uses the word there, helper, which is actually the word diakonis, a Greek word for deacon. And it simply means she served in the church. Phoebe had a ministry. Phoebe was faithful. So he asked those in Rome, hey, receive her, help her. She's delivering this letter for me. She has been a helper of many and of myself. Now, if if Paul was writing about you, hey, this is so-and-so, what would he say? What do you say, men, they had a ministry, they were faithful, they, 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 they served? Or, or, or what, how would he, if he was sending you to someone, would he address you? Oh, they were just a bump on a log. And what would he say if he wanted to commend you to someone else? And then Paul kind of shifts gears here in verses 3 and 4, and he talks about a couple that he wants to mention. He says, greet Priscilla. And Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. He he mentions a couple. We, We first see this couple in the book of Acts. When when Luke tells us they they were Jewish tent makers. There was a time when the ruler of Rome sent all the Jews out of Rome, didn't want them there anymore. So Priscilla and Aquila go to Corinth, and there they begin to conduct business as tent makers. Paul comes to that area. He's a tent maker. He connects with them, and he leads them to Christ. And Priscilla and Aquila probably had the first connect group or home group in their home in the city of Corinth. If you ever hear the name Priscilla and Aquila, I want you to think of Corinth and a church being planted there. 
a church that eventually had all kinds of issues and problems and crazy charismania stuff coming on. But they also, not only did they do that, but they traveled with Paul for a while. They, they went with him to Ephesus. They got involved in the synagogue. And all through the Bible, there's couples. Now, now let me have your attention. Of course, we could go all the way back to creation. We got Adam and Eve. They had their issues. They had their problems. We've got Abraham and Sarah. They, they were used by God to, to, to raise up a nation called the Jews. We, we've got Joseph and Mary. We, we know them. They, you know, they had their, their bumpy start and uh, they gave birth to Jesus. We, we've got couples that you see, and I would encourage you as you read through the Bible to recognize couple. Job. Remember Job and his wife, that great encouraging woman that he had in his life? <laughs> Curse God and die, Job. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll think about it. You've got Ananias and Sapphira. Remember them in the early church in the book of Acts? They, they lied to the Holy Spirit. They, they, they wanted to be like everyone else. Everyone was selling all their stuff and laying at the apostles' feet and trying to keep the church going and growing when it first started there in Jerusalem. And they said, hey, we'll, we'll tell them we sold it for this much. And they're used as an example in Scripture of a couple who had come together in a kind of contract of hypocrisy. And I want to say all that to say this, that God can really use a couple. A couple that's, that's you know, joined together, that are spiritually compatible, that, that hold each other up. And, and this is one of them in the Scriptures, Priscilla and Aquila. A powerful thing. You know, it's kind of like that three uh, bound cord that's not easily broken when a husband and a wife and the Lord kind of come together and they pray for each other and they encourage one another and they walk through life together. Priscilla and Aquila is a picture of this in the Bible. And I think one of the most powerful things in ministry is a couple that have each other's back, that care about each other. They care about the Lord, they care about others. And so Paul is saying, hey, I want to remind you about Priscilla and Aquila. In Acts chapter 18, it talks about their story a little bit. After these things, Paul departed from Athens, went to Corinth, and this is what he first found, a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because they had been commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he was a tent maker, he stayed with them and worked for, by occupation, they were tent makers. This was Paul's first experience with them. And now later in life, he's remembering them and, and giving attention to them. Now back to Romans chapter 16, where he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who risk their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but to also all the churches of the Gentiles. They, they risk their lives. There's a story in the book of Ephesians where, and in Acts where they protected and cared for Paul, it seems like, when he was in trouble, when there was a riot. The couple ministered in the synagogue. Luke tells us that they, they heard this preacher who came into the synagogue. His name was Apollos. And we, we have a little bit of the story in, in the book of Acts where, where it tells us a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures. He's an Old Testament scholar, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately, but you see the next verse, the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. He, he, he's coming from an Old Testament perspective. He knows the prophet John, and Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They thought, wow, this guy's gifted. He's a speaker. He knows the Old Testament well, and they explained, they discipled him. They explained to him the way of God more accurately. There's, there's more than just the baptism of John which was just repentance. They began to tell him about Christ and his death and his resurrection. And so they, they had a, an impact on this man, 
Apollos. In verse 5, likewise greet the church that is in their house. They, they had that church. Greet my beloved Eponius, who is the fru first fruits of Achaia. They had, a, they had a church in their home, in fact, probably for the first 300 years of the church, they met in homes. There was no buildings. There was a lot of persecution. The church was getting on its feet. And, and so for a long time, they met in homes. And he mentions this person, Eponius, says he was his first convert in the region of Achaia in southern Greece, or what we would call modern Turkey. And the translation here would be this, this individual, Eponius, is my first convert in that area. Now he's part of the church in Rome. And Paul remembers him. You know, I was in Tallahassee recently. We, we put together this meeting for guys from Alabama to St. Augustine and Jacksonville pastors. And we all came together and met in the middle at a friend of mine, Kent Nottingham's church. And um, I was sitting with Kent afterward. We were having lunch. He goes, hey, uh, there's a couple in our church that wanted me to say hi to you. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah, he said they were a part of your church way, way back when you first got started. Who is it? He said, well, it's this couple, uh, Gene and Brenda Kovacs. I go, yeah, I remember them. I remember when they came to the Lord. I said, I took them to Guatemala several times. And I said, yeah. He said, well, they speak highly of you and of your church, and they're involved in missions here. And, you know, it's interesting that we have this opportunity all through our life to invest in people and to share the gospel with them. And Paul was that kind of person. He said, he said, greet this guy. I remember him getting saved and I remember him coming to, he's one of my first fruits there. He goes on in verse 6 and he says, greet Mary who labored much for us. Now we don't know who this Mary was. But we do know that she worked hard. The word labored there means selfless. It means working till you're weary or you're tired. She, she had that kind of reputation. Hey, let's see if we can get Mary involved in this, this event. Let's see if we can get Mary involved in this, this, this ministry. Let's, let's, oh, let's get Mary in this because she's going to work. What if it was you? Hey, let's get so-and-so. Oh, no, they won't do anything. They show up for potlucks. Well, no, let's get so-and-so and see if they'll participate in a connect group. They, they won't. Really? Why not? Well, they're too busy. Oh, okay. But we're not. We're just bumps on a lock, so we can do that stuff. Well, let's get, get so-and-so, you know, to, to, to know that they'll come to worship. That's about all they'll do. But not Mary. Mary means that she was selfless, she was working, she was weary, she was tired. She, she had that kind of reputation. Here's who Mary was. Mary was faithful. Wouldn't you love to have that kind of, of, of sense about you? That people say, oh, yeah, yeah, call that. Yeah, that guy's faithful. That's who Mary was. And so, so Paul is saying, hey, you know, greet her and make sure you say hi to Mary. I mean, she is a tireless worker. And greet, verse 7, Andronachus and Junia. This is another couple. My countrymen, they were, they were Jews. And fellow prisoners, they had also gone to prison for their faith. And who were of note among the apostles who were in Christ before me. Oh, you mean they were saved before Paul? Yeah. They also went to prison. And they're also noted among the apostles as, as uh, people who served as sent ones, that they weren't apostles, but they were like apostles. They, they were sent. They did all kinds of ministry. Some people believe that these were probably part of the early church in Jerusalem because they were saved before Paul. And Paul used to persecute Christians. He was Saul of Tarsus. You know his first name. And that they probably knew Paul as Saul. They probably knew Paul before he was a Christian. I remember when my older brother died unexpectedly of a heart attack, and I had the privilege and the honor of participating and helping out in his funeral right here in the church. 
And the place was packed. He's a well-known surfer. And all these people came from different places, east and west coast. And we had surfboards all over the whole property. And we showed a video of Yancey. And uh, there was this one guy uh, that I lived in his surf shop one summer. His name is Skip. Me and a friend of mine named Brad and another guy named Glenn. And Skip was much older than us, and we thought he was super cool because he had long hair and had a girlfriend. Go in his apartment and had beads that hang through the you know the doorways. And, oh, I was like, man, how could anyone be this cool? <laughs> so so he let us live in his surf shop, and you know we 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 were long hair, uh, we were all ripped and handsome, kind of like I am now, and we we, we just loved Skip, and he he. You know, but we weren't Christians at all. So Skip showed up for the for the funeral, and I remember he 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 watched the service. He was here. We had a little reception over in the reception hall, and he came up to me in the reception hall and says, "Hey, I, I want to talk to you." I thought, ah, maybe Skip's interested in the Lord. Maybe he wants to hear my testimony or something. And he pulled me aside, and I sat down with him. We kind of back in the corner, and he goes. Uh, he goes, you know, I always thought Glenn and Brad would do okay, but I was worried about you. I looked at him, I said, really? He goes, you were bent a little different. <laughs> I go, yeah. And he goes, I'm so glad that you found religion and that this works for you. And I said, well, Skip, just a minute. I said, first of all, I'm not religious. He goes, you have a church. I go, I know, but I don't perceive it as religious. I see it as a relationship with the Lord. And I said, and this doesn't just work for me. This works for anybody. Christ transforms lives. You know that old story about the evangelist? I think it was D.L. Moody or one of those great evangelists who was up preaching one night and had a packed crowd and in those days, people would scream stuff from the audience, and one guy stood up and said he was an atheist, and he said, and if you're willing, I'll debate you tomorrow night right on that stage. And Moody looked at him and said, okay, you're on. He said, but here's the deal. I'm going to bring three drunkards whose lives have been completely changed. I'm going to bring three prostitutes who have left that occupation, now living normal lives, married and healthy, and he says... And they've been transformed by the power of Jesus. And so I want you to bring those same people who've been transformed by atheism. He didn't show up. Because lies aren't transformed by atheism. They're transformed by the power and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And, and, and that's what happened to me. And that's probably what's happened to you. It's not religion. It's, it, it's not some kind of thing that works for me. It's Christ. And people ha have seen you, they've seen me, they've seen our past life, and they see it now, and it can be a powerful testimony. They knew Paul before he was saved, and what a difference life was. He goes on in, in mentioning all these people, and he says, greet, verse 8, this person named Amplius, and that's an interesting name. From archaeology and from history... We know this was a common name among slaves. And there was a lot of slaves in Rome who had come to Christ. And he's in Rome, and possibly he could be one of the believers that were spoken of often in the household of Caesar. In Philippians chapter 4, you have this verse. It talks about that. It says, all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Now, now, let me have your attention. The gospel through slaves was making its way into the household of Caesar because Rome was filled with slaves. And this was a name that was well known as a name of slaves. It's a great testimony of the admonition that Paul gives in the book of Galatians chapter 3 where he says this, there's neither Jew nor Greek there's not a slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. And what he's saying is, listen, we're all the same in Jesus Christ. 
We're all sinners saved by grace, standing at the foot of the cross. No one can point the finger at anybody or look down on anybody. We are all family, brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's the truth. And so he mentions the name, possibly, of this slave. And, and then he goes on in verse 9, Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachius, my beloved. These are two very strong names. The first one is a Roman name. The second one is a Greek name. And, and Paul is like remembering all the servants who labored with him, who served with him in the gospel, and, and he holds them dear to his heart. He mentions in verse 10 this, this person called Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are the household also of Arastabolus, Apelles. You know what the uh, uh, approved in Christ means? It, it's a word that means tried and tested. Okay, now, now I know this is a lot of names. We're halfway through this. We're almost coming to, a, to an end. We've got a little ways to go. But let me just say this. Are you still there? It's a lot of names. So this guy, he's an interesting individual. He, he, he mentions his name. Apelles, who's approved in Christ. And that approved word means that he's tried and he's tested. And here's what it's saying. Someone who has been through the fire and he came out purified and strong. Now, let's just stop there for a second and let me say this. We all get tested. We all go through trials. All of us in this body of flesh are trying to go through life, and life is always and will be always hard. People die. Friends disappoint. I mean, if you're here today, you've gone through some trials. You've gone through some testing. If you, if you have kids, you've gone through testing, right? Right? I mean, I just spent a week with my daughter, Jenny. She's got two very small, active sinners in her life. <laughs> and they'll test you. They're little, but they can walk. They can't talk very good, but they can move around. And we were staying in this place. It's kind of on an embankment. And all of a sudden, they'd be gone. Like, oh, my gosh, where's Reed? Where's Grant? And they're like, this toddling in this giant steep hill. We're thinking, oh, my gosh. And you ask them questions, like there's stuff around, there's all kinds of, did you eat that? Big stuff on their face. No. <laughs> and, 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 you know, people test you. If you're married, you've been tested. Because a, a, a female and a male are about as different as you can possibly be biologically and psychologically. Have you found that to be true? And just go take a drive with your husband or your wife and get lost. It'll test you. So this man has been tried. He's been tested. And he's come through it. He's come out strong. See, here's the deal. This is where you want to come out. You want to come out strong. You don't want to come out bitter. You don't want to come out, oh, poor me, I'm a victim. You don't want to come out, oh, I'm offended. You don't want to come out living in the past for the rest of your life. You don't want to come out that way. He was someone, listen, this man was someone who chose to let God, through trials and difficulties, do something in him so God could do something through him. That's what testing does. God says, hey, I want to do something in you first. I mean, isn't it interesting how someone says, oh, God, do this through me. God, yeah, do work through my life, do this, this. God says, well, I'd like to, but I've got to do something in you first before I can do something through you. Oh, no, I don't want that. He goes, that's how it works. And he was corrected by trials. Do you know that we all need to be corrected at times? doesn't matter if you're this big or this big. We all need to be corrected. And trials and difficulties will test you and correct you and shape you and teach you. And God will use you as an example and as a testimony to others. That's who Apelles was, approved. And Paul said, hey, tell that guy hi. 
Greet him for me. He's been through the fire, and he's got great example. He goes on, greet Herodian, my countryman, a fellow Jew, verse 10. But before that, he says, those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Aristobulus. Do you know, we don't know if this is a fact or not, but we do know that Herod the Great, who murdered all the children in Bethlehem when Jesus was born, he had a grandson named Aristobulus. And it's possible that Aristobulus is the one mentioned here and that now he lived in Rome. We don't know that for sure. It'd be interesting, though, if the grandson was following the newborn king of Israel and his grandfather tried to kill him. Generations can change things. Some say that he's just saying the household of Aristobulus is the one who are to be greeted, that Aristobulus may not be a believer, but his household is. Maybe you know some Aristobuluses where the wife and the kids know the Lord. Maybe you are an Aristobulus. You come to church maybe with your wife, but you're not a Christian. You're dragging your feet. I, I would say all that to say this. If you know a family like this, or if you are, pray for Aristobulus, that he might come to know the Lord. Greet Herodian, verse 11, my countryman, a fellow Jew, perhaps connected to the royal family of Herod. And he goes on and says, and greet those who are of the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Another who perhaps had not come to the Lord, he mentions the household. Maybe the family was all converted, but the gospel was taking root and families were being impacted. And so he's greeting these. He, he, he goes on and he comes to an interesting couple here in verse 12. Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. And then he says, greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. The first two is present tense. Persia, who is a Persian name, seems that that's past tense, that she once labored for the Lord. These are all female names. And it's interesting, Tryphesa and Tryphosa, these feminine names, the first one, Tryphesa, means dainty, and the second one, mean, Tryphosa, means delicate. So here are these two females, dainty and delicate. Some believe they were twins, and that this woman who has the Persian name, perhaps Persis, who also, past tense, much labored in the Lord, discipled these two girls who were born dainty and delicate. And it says they labored. It means they toiled, they served, present tense. And here it is. Here's dainty and here's delicate. And you might see them. They're little. They're twins. And you think... Oh, come here, little dainty. Come here, little delicate. But they labored for the Lord. Can't always judge a book by its cover. Sometimes dynamite comes in small packages. And it seems like these two little girls who, who were possibly, you know, uh, discipled by this older woman, Persia, had an impact upon the church so much so that... Um, Paul has to greet them. Paul has to say something about them. Greet Rufus, he says in verse 13, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Wait a minute. Was this his brother? No, no it wasn't his brother, not his biological brother. Many believe that Rufus, whose father could have been Simon the Cyrene, who carried the cross in Mark chapter 15. Verse 21, they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrene, the father, and he mentions his children, Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear the cross. And many believe that Rufus, after this experience that his father had, came to the Lord, now living in Rome, 
was born again. And he says, greet his mother and mine. Not that it was his biological mother, but most likely some way that his mother cared for Paul during his ministry like he was her own son. You ever have people like that in your life? That they're not really related to you, but they treat you like you're a family member and they take care of you? I'll never forget this time. I, my older brother and I, we spent a winter in Corpus Christi, Texas. I had dropped out of high school. I was so brilliant, I didn't need high school. Later, I got back in when I got a little smarter. So we're living in, in Texas, and we're surfing, and my brother was a rep for this company, this lady called Jackie, who made surfwear. It was nice corduroy jackets and pants and trunks, and they were very high-end, very high quality. And so we would travel to Houston up and down the Gulf Coast repping these products. And she would always put us up in her mother's house. We called her Granny. Granny lived in Houston, and she was a piece of work. She invited us in her home. She'd let us stay there anytime we were in Texas. And she was like a surrogate mother. I'll never forget, she got up very early. And Yancey and I would be back in this room, really nice room, sleeping. And she'd bust through the door, and she'd go, Babies! Get up, babies. And we're like in our 20s, you know. Babies, it's time for breakfast. And we're in Texas. And, man, she would do breakfast. We'd go in there. It would be T-bone steaks and eggs. And we're like, whoa, we love granny. <laughs> and she treated us like, like her kids. She would hug us. Her, her husband wasn't that friendly. He was a truck driver, and he would sit over in his little chair, and he'd just look at us like, who are these long-haired surfers in my house? But I'll never forget Granny from Texas. She was awesome. And, and Paul says, hey, greet his mother. She treated me like I was her son. And, and, you, and you're fortunate to run into to people like that. Texans, they, they do everything big, and Granny all, always did. And he, he goes on, we're almost finished. He mentions, a, a rattles off all these names in verse 14, Astrakhan, Phil John Hermas, Parabus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them, greet Philagus and Julia. And he continues to rattle off these, the, these names, Olympus and all the saints who are with them. Paul doesn't tell us who they are or what they did, but here's what I found out what's amazing about him. Paul remembers their names. He knows them all. I mean, I can barely remember my grandkids' names. I have 11 of them. And Neil, my oldest son, decided to name all of his with L's. So when they're coming, there, L Lily, Lucy, Layla, uh, Liam, Le it's like, who, what, who are you? <laughs> I remember when he had the fifth one when he's pregnant, and he calls me up and says, Dad, we're having our fifth child. I went, wow, man, you're brave. I said, are you, are you going to do the L thing? He goes, yeah. I said, name it last. He, he said, no, we're, we're going to name it Leo, so the door's still open, far as I know. But Paul remembers all these names. I had a guy come up to me. It's not been long ago. I don't know if he's still here at the church. I apologize if you are. He walked up to me. He says, kind of in a, I don't know if he's having a bad day or what. And he said, you don't even know my name. I looked at him. I went, you're right. I don't know your name. He goes, your wife knows my name. My wife walked up. I said, Lynn, do you know his name? She goes, no. It's hard to remember names. I, I, I may not remember your name, but you know what? Jesus remembers your name. And John chapter 10, verse 3, I don't know if I put that verse up there or not. Yeah. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. Isn't that awesome? He knows your name. He knows you. Just like Paul knew, knew all these people. And, and, you know, I think about Paul closing out this letter this way. And I think it's not like Paul had a, uh, you know, a 
keyboard there, an unlimited amount of space. He's got a scroll of some size made out of papyrus or leather or something, and he's having this thing written out. And instead of continuing to deal with theology and to deal with, you know, who we are in Christ and all the great things he's been talking about, he decides to use the rest of the scroll that he has to mention names, rolls it up, gives it to Phoebe. It's an amazing letter with so much to say, but he leaves time at the end to mention all these people. Paul's just not interested in theology or evangelism. He cared for people. I want to read one of his comments as, as it captures the heart of him in First Thessalonians. It, it goes like this. It says, and this is Paul talking to those in Thessalonica. Catch the heart of Paul here. He says, we were gentle among you. Just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. I, I don't think it could be any more tender and nourishing than that. Paul said, that's how we were among you. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. Isn't that amazing? That's kind of what he's calling us to be and calling us to do. This is the character of Christ. We, we live in such an isolated world, especially with this pandemic right now. People go to work if they can. They come home. They shut the garage. They got a mask on. They don't talk. They, you know, that's why we're trying to promote these small groups. We want people to get back connected with one another. I think if we're not careful, the church can become dismembered in some ways. We need to stay together. We need to come together. We need to gather together. In verse 15, we're almost finished. He, he says this there in, in Romans, greet Philagus and Julia. Philagus is a great name. If you look at that spelling there, the last part of it you'll see has, has the term logos in it. And the, the actual name, it's a man's name, it's a boy's name, it means lover of the word. I mean, wouldn't that be a great name to give your son if you had a son, you know, come here, you little lover of the word, Philagos. It's kind of like the story of the little boy who, who wanted his first Bible, he had just learned how to read, and he, he t told his dad, he said, Dad, I want a Bible. He goes, oh, you want a Bible? Yeah, Dad, I want to read the Bible. He said, well, do you want, a, you want a Bible like Daddy's Bible? And he looked up at his dad kind of like, no, I want a Bible like Mommy's Bible. He goes, why? He says, well, her Bible, it seems, must be more interesting. She reads hers every day. You only take yours to church. Oh, ouch. Philagos, lover of the Word. He says, greet Philagos and Julia and Nerus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. And then he says this as he closes it out. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. That's a common greeting in that day. In Rome, you would kiss someone on the forehead or on the cheek. Today, it might be a holy hug or a good handshake. Some, something real, something heartfelt. Not a sensual kiss. Not a Judas kiss. But a holy kiss. A kiss that demonstrates genuine love and, and reverence and respect for someone. He, that's what he's saying. He's, ha he's saying, have genuine love for one another. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Verse 9, but concerning brotherly love, you should have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught, you're taught by God. There, there's something that God teaches us deep in our heart and our spirit that we should love one another. And I just want to close with this. Don't allow yourself to get pulled into all the weird rhetoric and anger and comments that are flying around in this political scenario that we're in right now. 
We, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Don't allow yourself to be pulled into, you know, those posts and, and those things on social media that separate and divide you from Democrat and Republic. Vote the way you want, but don't offend and go after people. God has taught you to love. I mean, I know there's two parties and they couldn't be separated far any further from one another. You got an elephant on this side, a jackass on this side. I mean, that's their emblems. But be careful how you treat people. God so loved the world. And don't allow yourself to get sucked into that battle. That's, that, 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 that's not necessary. You, you and I are called to be salt and light. We are called to love others, treat them with respect and honor. So be careful. This is a time, a difficult time. Greet one another with love is what he says.